Hi, this is Gotti Elkon with Selig Film News. I'm here with the team behind Dare to Drum, producer and director John Bryant, and music composer and musician Stuart Copeland. Uh, guys, what was last night like? That must have been really special. I know, um, you know, I saw Michael Caine coming up and I said hi to him and it just seems perfect that Deep Ellum Sounds, the category you guys are in, the history of, of this connection here to Dallas. Uh, what was last night like? <laughs> I've been trying to imagine it in my mind, you know, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> for the last year of working on this, what, where would it go, what would the first night be, and, and it was just every expectation, really, that I was hoping for. It was wonderful, the crowd was great, there was a lot of my friends, um, a lot of Stewart's fans, uh, just supporters that have been with this project, you know, from the beginning, and, and you know, showed out, and Nothing went wrong and, and everything went pretty well, so <laughs> it was great. You know, Stuart, it was funny when we were getting prepped for the red carpet, there, there was a big group of fans that were getting ready for your arrival, and uh, we haven't had that yet here at the festival. Hmm. Um, what's it like when you kind of have to enter into a space and you've got those fans? What, what goes? Well, there's two kinds of them. The fans are great. Mm -hmm. And I have warm feelings of love for them, and I wish to give them any, anything that they want. And they don't want much. They just want a second of your time and to a, and a share some love. Um, but there's another group that looks, you can discern the, the difference. Those are the professionals. Mm -hmm. And they're the guys who sell the autographs on eBay. And, and I can't imagine how they make enough money for them to be that desperate. But they're the people who check with the limo drivers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how, but they know when you're coming off a plane, they're waiting. When you check into the hotel, there they are. And how they know what hotel you're in, what plane you're arriving on, what plane you're leaving on, is, is one of those mysteries. I think that there's a cabal of limo drivers or something. Um, but the, leaving them aside, the fact that there are people who will come out, that's sort of what we do this for. Mm. You know, there, there's some incredible music going on, the, the, the hooking up with the symphony. I mean, I know that you all have done that before, but what, what was so special? I mean. Working with this guy, let's start there. Mm. You know, uh, Maestro Jaap van Zweden is one of those handful of musicians that if you're lucky enough to... Well, just for one thing, we have to call him Maestro. Yeah, <laughs> you got to call him Maestro. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a pretty, uh, pretty strong delineation right there. But, you know, he's inspirational to work with. He's one of those people that you run into that bring out the best in what you can do. And actually have you do some things that you weren't sure you could do mm. and, and excites you and you want to do more of that. So that's, that's really great. And, and, you know, what goes along with that is this understanding that we don't want to accept anything less than that, you know, and how do we get to that? And, and it's the music. It's not, it's not a personal thing. It's not a thing of, of competition even. It's really, we're serving the music here. What's the best we can do to make this music the best it can be? So it's, it's quite an experience. Stuart, you've worked with a lot of different symphony and symphony leaders, but what was your experience working and getting to know Maestro? There are two different kinds of these composer, conductors. Um, they're the ones that um, are the artistic director of the symphony. You know, um, I've had various of my works performed. When I'm not on stage, it's usually one of those guys, you know, uh, Vasily Petrenko in the Royal Liverpool, or, you know, the, these guys, they're stars. And then there's the, guy, the other guys that I work with, conductors, who are the working guys uh, who work for me. And they are not quite so brightly plumed, and their dance moves aren't so sexy. It's all business. They show everybody what they need. They have just, you know, the skills to get the orchestra to lean forward in their chairs, and actually, they are more malleable to me. I kind of prefer them, actually, because mm. it's a, it's a, I can go out and have a beer with him afterwards, you know. He hasn't got his maestro-ness to, uh, to sustain. The superstar guys, um, they own the orchestra, the building that the orchestra plays in, the trucks that brought the basses. They control everything. No decision gets made that doesn't go past maestro. <laughs> and, um, so those people are there, I think, because they have dancing skills, but also because they've proven that they can make an orchestra like Yap has made the Dallas Symphony a world-class orchestra. That's why they give him the keys to the city. <laughs> and um, so these two different kinds of conductors have different advantages. Hmm. Well, that's well put. Yeah. You know. um, 
let's jump back to that night. And uh, Mother Nature obviously had its own mindset of how that evening would go. Looking back, what are your what memories do you think of when you think to that night? Well, um, you know, it wasn't, uh, the, there was a night of performance, but there was uh, five days of tension and drama, not knowing whether that night would take place. Mm. So, um, you know, it started off with a bang, our first rehearsal, you know, of hearing the piece for the first time on the stage of the Meyerson with Maestro conducting and, uh, you know, the, the whole tension of, how is he going to feel about this? Is he going to like this? Uh, you know, what's he going to say about it? All of that stuff going on. And the orchestra wasn't there yet. And, and it turned out to be, you know, a great day. And we were all excited. Oh, this is going to be wonderful. And then the, snow, the storm hit the next morning and immediately, you know, wiped out three rehearsals and two performances. You know, well, not immediately. It, each day it added to the drama. But we went from day to day to day wondering, is this going to happen? So it was, it was tough. And, and when we did get the one performance on Saturday, you know, all of that tension turned into joy and, and release. So it was great. Yeah. It was great that three nights worth of audience were crammed into one night worth <laughs> of seats. Yeah. And so it was, it was packed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That always helps. Yeah. yeah. Um, can y'all talk about what it is about music y'all love? Like what, what it is about sound that attracts you? I mean. You guys have worked in different elements of, of music and not just one specific type. What makes you listen to something and just fall in love with it? Music has many benefits um, and many purposes in society. The main two me, being social cohesion, social cohesion and uh, sexual selection. Um, and uh, you know, music is a, has a very powerful effect on intercommunications between the opposite sexes who are, who are judging each other for suitability, uh, for exchanging uh, reproductive um, elements. And music is the language of love. It, music causes males and females to express themselves publicly sexually. Uh, <laughs> You know, they thrust their pudenda at each other in a public <laughs> space because there's a music playing. Because one or other of us is banging on a drum, <laughs> holding down a beat. It's okay for perfectly well-behaved people to behave rather bizarrely. You turn the music off, and that's kind of strange behavior. Music makes it okay. That's one thing I like about music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> It's like when you were a kid and you look in the, the Marvel comics in the back, there are advertisements and there are, you know, X-ray specs, you know. <laughs> and as an as a eight-year-old, I think, wow, you mean I can see through girls' clothes? <laughs> well, becoming a, musician, me, becoming a musician is sort of like having those X-ray specs. Wow. Yeah. And it was like that for me, you know, with, uh, uh, when the Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan show, and I'm just at that age where I'm really starting to look at girls, and then you see a room full of girls screaming at these guys <laughs> on stage playing. Yeah, that had a pretty strong, it was like, now there is a door I can walk through to meet some girls. I just need to figure out what am I going to play and how do I play it. And it was very much that. It was very much that. My I mean, I had loved music before the age of 12, and I had you know, actually performed a little bit, and I was, you know, I had already decided I loved music, but I didn't know exactly why, and then it became crystal clear, you know, why. Nice. Well you know, it sounds, it sounds like we're, we're sort of treating this in a very flippant way, yeah. um, but in fact, I think it is deeply true mm -hmm. that um, it's not just a matter of getting girls. The fact that we want to get girls is this all is very elemental stuff in our intellect we're much more we have much too much respect for the women that we know and the people that we know as people but music is a way of objectifying our base instincts and we feel i mean if we're, we're putting it into words we just picked up drums to get girls it's a little deeper than that yeah. actually yeah. um and on the surface that's sort of what it is but the fact that we want to grab that language and express our genetic superiority through music, <laughs> that's significant. Wow. Yeah. Is it amazing to, to see it in multiple cultures all around the world? You guys have shown us that in the film, but you guys have personally lived that too. You've seen the impact of music on a cultural level. What, what's it like journey-wise for you guys with the drums and music? Well, 
Um, this film is about specifically um, world percussion kind of landing in Indonesia, specifically Bali and Java. And it's, it, it's the same story, just with a different twist. You have a group of musicians. There are uh, male and female dancers that are dressed in this, you know, this just be like, you know, they're peacocks with the feathers up, you know, it's beautiful. And there's a reason for this. It's like, here's a, here's a forum by which we can play music, we can dress, we can dance, we can do all these different things to really express ourselves and forget about our worries and go somewhere else. And so, you know, it just, uh, it's just, it's, it's around the world, it's celebrated, but just in slightly different ways. Hmm. Um, Stuart, what's it like landing in a different place and getting to know the musicians that you're going to be working with in, in these types of settings where it is a, a bigger group? Well, in this case, there were two layers of it. There were the five D-drum cats. Five, I, you know, they, they don't like it when I do, but like it's like <laughs> Duck Dynasty <laughs> landed in the middle of the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. Uh, Two of them are, I mean, these are highly sophisticated individuals. <laughs> and it's only because I come from California and I hear that, ca that, that Texas twang. And I, <laughs> think every, talking about? and I think everybody just rose up from the swamp. <laughs> you, know, even, even, you know, even Doug Smith, who's one of the most respected uh, percussionists in the world. Uh, Doug Howard. Doug Howard. Uh, yeah, you got to you uh, yeah. combine them. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the five of them are all insane. They're five deeply individual characters, but I've kind of mushed them to the same. And then the next level is the orchestra. The orcs, as I like to call them, uh, they are intimidating uh, to rock and roll musicians because we don't, and, and they are intimidated by musicians. There's a sort of a standoffishness. Each side thinks the other is snooty, but in fact, we are brother musicians, but from of a very different feather. You know, they connect with music visually uh, through notes on the page. The rock musicians don't. You know, how do you get a rock musician to shut up? put a sheet of music in front of him. <laughs> and so they, you know, we come from different worlds. But in fact, I've discovered through reaching across the water that those guys are real interested. And I'm real interested in them. You know, for every piece I've written, this piece here, you know, I was up there talking to the, to the uh, brass players about mutes, you know. And I ask them, and they talk about which mutes to, all day. Do you want that eh sound, or do you want the ooh sound, or do you want a ooh wah wah sound, you know. And just get talking to them, and you can learn stuff. And for me, as a composer, I want to learn stuff. You know, with a band, you get to play uh, every night, and you can figure it out. With an orchestra, there's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. They're expensive. To put them on the stand, to run through once costs a lot. So you don't get that many opportunities. So if I have them all in the room, I'm going to go and talk to everyone and learn everything I can while they're in their chairs. Awesome. Um, so kind of last question, guys. Where do you see this film going? Where do you want it to go? And um, also, just what's next for you guys? I mean, I know you guys are busy. It's, uh, so far as the film, I mean, I, I think the obvious path is to play some more film festivals and mm -hmm. get a reaction and let people see it so that we can know um, who is our market, who are the people out there that care about this. I mean, we've got a pretty good idea, but, um, you know, with, with uh, the film distribution world changing all the time and with, you know, with with online downloads and streaming. Are you gonna watch it on Netflix? Are you gonna watch it on HBO? Is it gonna be on PBS? These questions are really, you know, the answers are changing all the time. So, you know, I, I just, I want it to get out, be seen, and then let the, the best possibility come to us, so to speak, as to where it goes from there, you know. Hmm. What's up next for you guys? We kind of jumped on the red carpet a little bit about all the work you're in, but is there anything you can share with us that we can follow that's coming out? Well, there's um, another concerto for this. Uh, you know, that piece was written for these five guys and orchestra. The next piece, called Tyrant's Crush, commissioned by the Pittsburgh Symphony, uh, is for me an orchestra. <laughs> and I'm not sure which is better. <laughs> I like playing, and I like playing with orchestra. There's a whole, it's a, there's a whole fun, it just feels very magnificent. It feels important. I feel like an actual musician and drummers don't get that much. Um, but it's also really great to watch these gentlemen break a sweat. <laughs> it's all about the sweat <laughs> and the dancing and the lady. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, they've done it a few times. The last time um, the drum played this piece was with the Corpus Christi Symphony. Oh, okay. And they're getting real good at it. I noticed the guys, even the, these uh, 
classical guys, these orchestral players, they're beginning to put on a little show. There's a little <laughs> strut going there. You know, they're, they're getting a little Mick Jagger going there. <laughs> well, thank you guys. I think it's great to end with Mick. And uh, <laughs> thank you guys for bringing this film and, and bringing here, you know, Dare to Drum. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thanks, thank Sarah. you. Thanks, Appreciate Sean, it. So thank much. you. Thank you.